Put up that tabernacle picture, if you would. I hope it showed up because that was a son of a gun to line out last night and make sure everything went in order. <laughs> That's the tabernacle. That's what it looked like. It was also called the tent of meeting, and it was the temple before the temple. It was like the portable temple before Israel made it into their land and built the, the permanent temple. They could move this one around. And uh, so we're going to go into Exodus 36 and verse 8. We're going to talk about the tabernacle having been built, okay? Exodus 36 and 8, building the tabernacle. Then all the gifted artisans among them who worked on the tabernacle made ten curtains woven of fine linen and of blue, purple, and scarlet thread with artistic designs of cherubim they made them. The length of each curtain was 28 cubits and the width of each curtain four cubits. The curtains were all the same size. And he coupled five curtains to one another, and the other five curtains he coupled to one another. He made loops of blue yarn on the edge of the curtain on the sel selvage of one set. Likewise, he did on the outer edge of the other curtain of the second set. Fifty loops he made on one curtain, and fifty loops he made on the edge of the curtain on the end of the second set. The loops held one curtain to another. And he made 50 clasps of gold and coupled the curtains to one another with the clasps that it might be one tabernacle. One. Guys, we're talking about unity here, okay? Verse 14. And he made curtains of goat's hair for the tent over the tabernacle. He made 11 curtains. The length of each curtain was 30 cubits and the width of each curtain, 4 cubits. The 11 curtains were the same size. He coupled five curtains by themselves and six curtains by themselves, and he made 50 loops on the edge of the curtain, that is, the outermost in one set, and 50 loops he made on the edge of the curtain of the second set. He also made 50 bronze clasps to couple the tent together, that it might be one. Then he made a covering for the tent of ram skins dyed red, and a covering of badger skins above that. Okay, put that tabernacle tent picture up. Now, I told you you were going to get very excited about this story, and after what we read, loops and curtains and clasps and stuff, how are we going to get excited about that? <laughs> I'll try to get you there, okay? <laughs> it gets good. But this, I think this is a cross-section. Is that a cross-section picture view of what the tabernacle tent looked like? It was basically the portable temple before the temple now, the gifted artisans, they put in their very best work, it said, and the same goes for us. We should put in our very best work when we serve the Lord God. Everything you do should be your best that you can do and when we are in service to the body of Christ. Do it as God has gifted you. Now, Exodus 36 and 20. For the tabernacle, he made boards of acacia wood standing upright. The length of each board was 10 cubits and the width of each board a cubit and a half. Each board had two tenons for binding one to another. Thus he made for all the boards of the tabernacle, and he made boards for the tabernacle, 20 boards for the south side, 40 sockets of silver he made to go under the 20 boards, two sockets under each of the boards for its two tenons. I am a very visual learner because when I read something like that, I go, what in the world are we talking about? So I dug up the best pictures I could find. Put up that next picture there. You can see each board had two sockets, and the sockets were made out of silver. 
Now you can see how the boards had somewhat of a notch on it that fit into the sockets in, in place. Those were tenons, right? That notch tab thing is the tenons for each board. Verse 24, we read, it says that each board has two tenons to fit in the two sockets per board. Okay, so this is how they built the walls of the tabernacle in this form, right? In this format right here. And I want you to recognize that the foundation is silver that holds them together. You've got boards that are set up vertically into silver sockets, and the silver sockets are the foundation. Not only is it the foundation, but it holds them together. Exodus 36 and 25. And for the other side of the tabernacle, the north side, he made 20 boards, and there are 40 sockets of silver, two sockets under each of the boards. For the west side of the tabernacle, he made six boards. Okay, next picture. Okay, the north side had 20 boards of acacia wood, boards, and now the south side had 20 boards also, and all these boards were overlaid with gold. These wooden acacia tree boards were overlaid with gold. So what you have is this elongated structure that is taking place, it's taking shape here. It has a north wall, a south wall, and a west wall, and they left the east side open because that was the doorway to go in, how you got inside it. Exodus 36 and 28. He also made two boards for the two back corners of the tabernacle, and they were coupled at the bottom and coupled together at the top by one ring. Thus he made both of them for the two corners. So there were eight boards and their sockets, 16 sockets of silver, two sockets under each of the boards. Next picture. Man, you got to have pictures to understand what this is talking about. I'm telling you. <laughs> Here's how they fit the corners together. They were double boarded back there for strength. And they had a locking ring at the top to make sure they were held tightly together. Next picture. This shows verse 29, I think, uh, how the bottom of the corner was coupled together by a ring. So you can see why verse 30 says there were eight boards, because it took six boards to make the back wall, plus two more boards were added to the corners to make the corners a lot more rigid, so it would stand up better. And they were all tabbed into silver sockets at their foundation. Silver foundation. Exodus 36 and 31. And he made bars of acacia wood, five for the boards on one side of the tabernacle, five bo bars for the boards on the other side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the boards of the tabernacle on the far side westward. And he made the middle bar to pass through the boards from one end to the other. He overlaid the boards with gold, made their rings of gold to be holders for the bars, and overlaid the bars with gold. We have another picture. You should be able to see the bars now. The bars, uh, five bars, two on the top, you got two on the bottom, and one solid bar that went through the middle of the wall, just like 33 says. Verse 33 says that. Verse 34 says the rings of gold were to hold the bars together. And if you want to find out even more information about the structure of this tabernacle, you can learn more about these rings also in Exodus 26, where God gave more instructions on how to build this tabernacle. So Exodus 26 has more information as well. Exodus 36 and 35. And he made a veil of blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine woven linen. It was worked with an artistic design of cherubim. He made for it four pillars of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold, with their hooks of gold, and he cast four sockets of silver for them. Okay, cherubim were angelic-looking shapes, and whenever a priest would go into the tabernacle, he'd see these angelic shapes in the veil, and he would be reminded of the awesomeness of the work he was in there to deal with when he was in there doing their sacrifice work. But show the four sockets picture now. So a wall was put up to divide the Holy of Holies, the innermost room, apart from the rest of the tabernacle, because the Ark of the Covenant was to go in there in the very, very back, in that innermost room. And that's where the presence of God would dwell with man. Did you know that God dwelled with man long before Jesus? He came here, but he was separate because the way hadn't been made for us to come directly to him. He was kept separate behind these veils. So they put up these four pillars that you can see here now to hold up a veil to keep sinful man from going into the Holy of Holies and tainting it. 
with the sin. Now, that's why these four pillars were made, and we have four more silver sockets that were there as the foundation for these four pillars. So we've got 96 sockets that go all the way around, plus these four, and we now have 100 total silver sockets. Think of 100% silver, okay? Exodus 36 and 37. I am starting to get excited about what I'm about to unload on you, that I'm almost ready to take off early, but I still got to get through this information. Slow down, Ray. It's like the horse running to the barn. He's in a big hurry. <laughs> Exodus 36 and 37. He also made a screen for the tabernacle door of blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine woven linen made by a weaver and its five pillars with their hooks. And he overlaid their capitals and their rings with gold, but their five sockets were bronze. Uh-oh, something changed. Silver, 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 bronze. What's going on? Show the bronze sockets picture. And we've seen this picture before, but if you look close at the doorway, you'll see the five bronze sockets. They're a different color than the rest of the other ones that are made of silver. I was actually researching pictures of the tabernacle, and I saw a lot of JPEGs on the internet that had those sockets were silver. And I'm like, that's wrong. They're supposed to be bronze. And I wanted to email, who did this picture? You're off. <laughs> They're bronze. And the bronze sockets at the door, you can see they were spaced apart so that people could walk in through the door between them, just like those four silver sockets in the innermost veil were also spread apart so that the one high priest once a year could go in there, he could walk between them in that, behind that innermost veil. I don't yet totally have a biblical reason why these five sockets at the door were made of bronze instead of silver. However, by observation, just by seeing what's going on with the tabernacle, since it was part of the outside, the five bronze sockets were part of the outside of the building, it had to match the other items that were also outside. You see here that the outside had the bronze laver where the priest would wash their hands. They would have to purify their hands for work. And you also had the bronze altar out there where that's where the sacrifice animals were burned up. I also think of the bronze snake in Numbers chapter 21, if you remember that, the bronze snake that Moses raised up over the Israelites. Remember, Israel had sinned, and they made a bronze snake, and they raised it up, and that was judgment on Israel, and they all got messed up over it because they'd sinned real bad. So in my biblical observation, everything outside was bronze because it was illustrative of God judging and condemning sin. Bronze was a judgment metal, a judgment color. Matter of fact, Jesus said in John 3, 14, he said, as Moses lifted up the serpent, that's the bronze snake, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So see, God's judgment of, for us fell on Jesus. He compared himself to that bronze snake. Jesus related his own condemnation at the cross to the bronze serpent. So I'm, I'm not saying this is a definite here. I'm telling you just in my observation, it appears to me that bronze is associated with judgment of sin. So then everything on the outside of the tabernacle that we see, the bronze laver, the bronze altar, and then now you've got these outer door sockets, they were also bronze, everything outside. Outside of the tabernacle is where the washing of hands was at the burning of sacrifices. It was the doing away of filthiness out there in the bronze zone. But then as you come inside the tabernacle, when you get closer to the presence of God where the ark of the, was at in the Holy of Holies, then the metals became silver and gold, much more precious and much more valuable as you get closer to the presence of God. Look at that. Bronze is not worth near as much as silver and gold. The closer you get to the Lord God, the more valuable it becomes. Perhaps this could be in alignment. Now, I'm just thinking here, maybe it matches. Perhaps this could be in alignment with 2 Corinthians 4.16. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. You get more precious and more valuable the closer inside you go, right? 
I'm excited about some things we read here, and I want to talk about it. I'm really fascinated by these sockets, these silver sockets, as well as the gold-covered boards. First off, how did the Israelites get all this stuff? They're lost out in the desert. How did they get all this gold and all this silver? First off, when God brought the Israelites out of Egypt, he had them plunder the Egyptians on their way out. They took all their silver and their gold items from them for the 400 years of brutal slavery that they put the Israelites under. And the Egyptians gave it to them willingly. It was like, get out of here. We want you gone. Because they were going through these plagues. People were dying. And so get out. Yes, take my silver, take my gold, go get everything in the house, give it to these Israelite people. Just get out of here. That's how they got all this silver and gold. So now that the people had this wealth, now here's something to consider. They had a lot of silver, a lot of gold. Oh, I'm rich now. I can do what I want with it. Wait a minute. Something had to move these people to want to give this silver and gold to the tabernacle so that they could make all this stuff that we've got here. You can't just sit on your wealth and go, this is mine. I'm keeping it. It's supposed to be utilized for God's purposes. So how did they give it towards the tabernacle instead of trying to keep it for themselves? Exodus 38 and 25 says, And the silver from those who were numbered of the congregation was 100 talents and 1,775 shekels, according to, very important, the shekel of the sanctuary. That's important there, the shekel of the sanctuary. Verse 26, which is a becca for each man. That is half a shekel, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. For everyone included in the numbering from 20 years old and above, for 603,550 men. It's a lot of people. <laughs> okay. What you have here is the shekel of the sanctuary. That's when the Israelites gave for the sanctuary of the tabernacle. That was their offering that they gave. Every person that was over 20 years old was to give a becca, which is a half a shekel. And there were a lot of people that gave, and they all gave until they reached 100 talents of silver, according to verse 25. So that's where you get those 100 talents of silver from to make those sockets. It came from Egyptian plunder, and that was given to the sanctuary as an offering. Exodus 38 and 27. And from the 100 talents of silver were cast the sockets of the sanctuary and the bases of the veil. 100 sockets from the 100 talents. One talent for each socket. There's your 100 sockets. That's how we got it. That's how they got the material. That's how they came to be. It was an offering of the, uh, shek the half shekel. Now, it says that each socket was one talent. What is a talent? A talent is a measurement of weight. It's somewhere between 75 to 100 pounds. It's also a measurement of uh, money. Just like the British pound is also a pound of weight. It's kind of a similar thing. So you have a talent that was a lot of money. How much money was this? It took the average worker a full 20 years to earn enough money just to make one talent. That's how much these suckers were worth. So take whatever you make this year times 20. That's probably what it was like if you were to buy one of these sockets, okay? <laughs> so we have 100 silver sockets, and they served as the foundation of the tabernacle. Now, we read that the people gave a half a shekel for the sanctuary offering until it was enough to make 100 sockets, right? We know that. But do you know what the spiritual purpose of the half shekel was for? Yes, the, the, the material purpose was to make the sockets, but what was the spiritual purpose of the half shekel offering? Pay close attention to these next verses, and I want you to see if you can tell me what was the half shekel for, because there is a word that appears at least three times, and it starts with the letter A. That's your hint, okay? I want you to tell me what the half shekel was for. Exodus 30 and 15. The rich shall not give more, and the poor shall not give less than a half a shekel when you give an offering to the Lord to make atonement for yourselves. And you shall take the atonement money of the children of Israel and shall appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of meeting, that it may be a memorial for the children of Israel before the Lord to make atonement for yourselves. 
So what was the half shekel for? Atonement. I mean, I think the Bible was trying to really emphasize to us, hello, it's, it, this is what it is, and it told us three times. I'm kind of like that. If you really want something to stick, you've got to tell me more than once, okay? <laughs> So it was for atonement. Atonement, what is that? It is the covering, the payment for something that was done wrong, for an injury or for a repair. That's what atonement is. And notice that it didn't matter if you're rich or poor, the same price for atonement covered everybody, rich or poor. I'll give you a quick Jesus parallel for you here. The price that Jesus paid on the cross for you is the same price that covers the sins for all of us, whether you are rich or whether you are poor. It was the same price for all of us to have our atonement sin covered. But friends, what we see here is that the foundation of the tabernacle was made from the cost of atonement. So the foundation of the tabernacle represents an offering that has been paid for to cover you. I see Jesus here already. The foundation of the tabernacle where the praise and the sacrifice comes in, it was founded upon atonement. Do you realize that the very foundation of our worship comes from the fact that we've been paid for? Doesn't that drive your praise? When I praise God, it comes from the fact that, God, you saved me. Thank you. And then I praise him for it. That's the foundation, atonement. But no wonder that it says in Psalm 22, 3, but you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. So good. So when the Israelites were praising God, sacrifice work in that tabernacle, all the praise going, at God was enthroned in there on that ark, founded upon the silver of atonement. Oh, it's getting good. My atonement has been paid for by Jesus' sacrifice. So get this. The silver sockets show us two different things. They show us atonement and they show us foundation. Atonement and foundation. 1 John 2 and 2, Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. 1 Corinthians 3.11, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. I see Jesus in these sockets. Do you see it? That's what I'm trying to show you. These sockets show Jesus. Jesus Christ is our foundation, and he is the only one that has paid for his people's atonement. Are y'all getting all this? this it's here. <laughs> I mean, I'm not making this stuff up. I'm not good enough to pull this stuff off. This is what's here. This is what I'm reading. <laughs> the tabernacle is the design of God Almighty. Look how this looks when you have your gospel goggles on. This is exciting stuff. So we have our foundation, and we have our atonement in Jesus Christ. But now there's something else about these sockets. Do you remember how much each socket weighed? How much did it weigh? It weighed one talent, one talent of silver. I want to show you how much a talent of silver can buy. First Kings 20 and 39. Now as the king passed by, he cried out to the king and said, your servant went out into the midst of the battle and there a man came over and brought a man to me and said, guard this man if by any means he is missing, your life shall be for his life or else you shall pay a talent of silver. Guys, how much does it cost to buy a life? It costs one talent of silver to buy a life. Uh-oh. So what we have here to buy back something is the word redeem. If he, you're, he was going to buy this guy back, he'd have to use a talent of silver. That word is redeem, to buy back. Psalm 19, 14, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. He bought us back. So each of these silver sockets represented atonement and our foundation upon Jesus Christ, and the value of each silver socket, uh, socket represented what it cost to buy our life back from sin. Oh, does it get any better? Yes, it does, because I have more to tell you. We're not done yet. <laughs> There's more. 
We talked about how much they weighed. We talked about what they symbolized and all this other stuff. But what are these sockets made of? They're made of silver. The sockets are made of silver. Psalm 12 and 6, the words of the Lord are pure words like silver, tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Seven is the number of completeness in the Bible. That means it's completely, completely pure. So purified silver represents absolutely pure truth. Truth. So we have this foundation of atonement, the price of our redemption, which is also truth. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Are you all about to explode yet? My head is about to pop after reading all this stuff, all this symbolism that God put into this. This is too good. So now remember, the blue, purple, and scarlet veils that covered the way in to get inside. These colors were a very hard color to produce back then. It was very hard to get this color. What they had to do is they had to go out and find these certain bugs and find a whole big basket of these bugs. They had to look under rocks and plants and all this stuff. And they get this particular bug and they come back and they crush them up. Who wants to do that? I feel like crushing bugs. Okay. She crushed up all these particular bugs and it produced this purple and blue. That's the only way they got it. We've got blue here easy because we, we know how to make, you know, dyes out of stuff. But back then, it was very expensive and it took so much work to produce blue, scarlet, and purple that only the people who were royalty could afford to buy it. I want you to look at Esther 8 and 15. It says, So Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel of what? Blue and white? and a great crown of gold, and a garment of fine linen and purple. That's royal colors. It's very expensive. Nobody could buy it but royalty. So I want you to go back to the show the four sockets picture that I hope is now there. So remember that the doorway into the tabernacle was covered with a blue, purple, and scarlet veil. Also the inner room, the Holy of Holies, where the ark was at, where God's presence dwelled, that was blocked off with a blue, purple, and scarlet veil also. Also, way outside the tabernacle, the outer courtyard, it had the only way in. And even that one way was also scarlet and purple too. Friends, what we see here is that the one and only way to come to the presence of God is through royalty. That's the only way you can get in, is through royalty. Luke 1.33, And he, Jesus, will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Jesus is King Jesus. When people slip and they go, oh, Jesus this, and they cuss, I'm just like, hey, that's my king you're talking about there. I take it serious. He is my king. He's my Lord. He's royalty. King Jesus is the way in. He's the only way in, as we see with the blue, purple, and scarlet veils. King Jesus is the truth, as the tabernacle was founded upon pure silver. King Jesus is the life, as the value of each silver socket was the cost that it cost to buy a person's life back. Friends, King Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And you can see all of that right there in the tabernacle. Isn't that exciting? If the Bible doesn't excite you, you're not reading it, okay? So back then, God dwelled with man on the Ark of the Covenant. Then God dwelled among us through Jesus Christ. And because of what Jesus did on the cross, the Holy Spirit of God can now dwell within our own Holy of Holies. You know, I have an, a Holy of Holies myself. It's called my inner being. It's called my spirit. And that's where the Lord God comes to dwell with us. Jesus' name means God with us. Jesus died for us on the cross to atone for our sins, to cover and pay for it, to pay our redemption price so that we could come in through him, come in through the scarlet, come in through the purple and blue. That's the only way in is through that royalty. And friends, this is why the Lord wants us to assemble in his presence. 
In fact, did you know that attending church is God's command that we do it? There's a lot of people, they don't care to go to church. And they say, well, I'm saved, but I don't need to go to church. I want you to see that God did all of this to dwell with us so that he, we would assemble together for him and that he commands us to do it. Look at this, Hebrews 10, 24 says, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. This is the verse that the non-churchers want to keep very quiet. They want to say, yes, I believe in Jesus. He's my Lord. But you go to church? No, I don't. I don't have to. Okay, so you don't have to do what God commanded you to do. I always ask him, if God came in here and gave you a command right now, would you do it? Oh, absolutely, because he's my Lord. And then I show him Hebrews 10, and then they go, oh, I don't like that. All of a sudden, I don't have to obey God anymore. You got to be in the church, guys. It's, it's a safe place to be. The way I see it, if God commands it, then you better do it. If he's Lord, you, you obey him. Now, let's think about the golden boards made of acacia wood. I want you to think about this, because we're talking about assembly, getting together. Where does acacia wood come from? I got to thinking about that, and in my advanced mind of extreme uh, intelligence, I came to the fact that acacia wood comes from an acacia tree. <laughs> so show that tree picture. <laughs> this is an acacia tree. Guys, it doesn't look anything like a board. It looks nothing like a board. It doesn't. This means that somebody had to do a lot of work to change that acacia tree into something completely new. Somebody had to go out and find this acacia tree, cut it down, and then cut it down into planks, and then overlay the planks with gold to be used for the walls. And so when you have a golden board at this point, they're no longer what they used to be because they're not a tree anymore. They are now a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Well, I don't have to go to church to be, oh, come on. You said that when you weren't saved. Now that you are saved, you're supposed to be new. So stop saying that. <laughs> That's what I want to tell people. Quit that. <laughs> but friends, there was a time before I was saved. There was a time when I was not saved by the Lord God, and I was like a tree. I had my roots deep down in the earth. I relied on this world instead of trusting in God. My roots were way down in the world. But then one day, the Lord came along and cut me down. And I'll tell you, I hated it. When the Lord got hold of me for real, I fought him. I argued with him. I yelled at him. I shook my fist at him. How dare you do this to me? But he cut me down. But when he cut me down, I lost everything that I once had. I wanted my roots. I wanted my branches reaching out for all these things I wanted to get. But he took me away from that. I'm like, Lord, you destroyed my life. I was upset. When God cut me down, I was severed from my roots that I once had deep down in the world, and it hurt. It was very painful, this change. But Jesus laid me onto his carpenter's work table, and he put me on this work table, and he cut me down even more. He used a spiritual wood plane on me, and he smoothed me down. I lost even more of what I used to have. I was cut down into a totally new shape. And right when I felt like I had lost everything I had, when I lost everything I once was, that's when I thought it couldn't get any worse. I'm nothing like I used to be. That's when Jesus overlaid me with pure gold, his righteousness. Now we're going somewhere. And now I am valuable. Now I am precious. 
and now I have great worth. And so now I'm no longer a tree rooted down in the earth because now my foundation has now been set upon the pure, redemptive truth of King Jesus, the Messiah. And the foundation of Christ has been designed for us in such a way to get us to assemble next to each other. Like these boards, we're supposed to be close to each other. Assemble, uh, to assemble me up next to others who have also been remade just like I have been. Now, like we saw of the silver sockets, Jesus has fitted me together with other people who are just like me, who were cut down, who lost what they had, who were made into a new shape and overlaid with gold. I'm fitted right up next to them. And he has reinforced us in assembly. Very key thing here, assembly. All upon the foundation of his truth to reinforce us together, to make us all strong. Friends, this tabernacle here shows us a picture of the body of Christ assembling together with other believers, just like all the golden boards that were assembled to make up the house of God. This assembly is where the Lord God is praised. That's why God commands us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Oh, yeah, I'm a board. Yeah, you look like a tree to me. We're to be together, assembled. It is God's design that we be together. For those who think it's okay to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, I want you to consider again that a golden board looks nothing like a tree. Friends, I want to ask you a question. Which one are you? Are you a board? Or are you a tree? Are you willing to be committed in, I mean in, in the body of Christ, in the assembly of believers, out of just thanks for all the hard work that Jesus did to make you into a new creation? Or do you insist on being a distant, way out there tree, off by yourself, keeping your roots way down deep in the earth? Well, I got the world to, to rely on. Which one are you? An acacia tree has no way to claim that it is part of the tabernacle of God because it just doesn't fit. And neither would you walk out in the desert and find a board planted in the ground out in the middle somewhere either. You're in one place or the other. Most people, they want to keep their roots in the earth. They don't really trust in the Lord, even though they say they do. Oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but they're not really trusting in him. Why? Because they haven't been remade new. That's the whole kicker. You have to be remade new. You can't be anything like you used to look like. So I hope you notice that a major theme in Exodus 36 in this tabernacle is assembly. It's assembly. The boards were assembled together. One board united to another board, held together by a silver socket, locking rings, reinforcement bars, all this double-cornered reinforcement stuff. Friends, what I'm trying to say is that the safest place to be is founded upon Jesus Christ, and if you really are on that foundation, then you will be obediently in the assembly where God makes us strong together. That's where you will be. Well, I'm saved just because I don't go to church. Oh, come on. After studying this, you can't, you can't get that excuse anymore. You can't be out there with your roots in the world part of the time and in the assembly of God part of the time because either you're a tree or you're a board. I think God is telling us here we need to assemble before him. Isaiah 44 and 22, come to me, for I have redeemed you. Redeemed. There's that silver socket again. Again, the price of a person's life. Friends, I'm going to tell you the pure truth here, that we are saved by the blue, scarlet, and purple royalty of Jesus Christ, who is our way in who is our truth, who has redeemed our lives. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is God with us. Doesn't this drive you to want to praise him some more? Let's do that. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for Exodus 36 of the tabernacle. Lord, I, I didn't know this until, Lord, you... Put it in front of me in picture form like this. Wow. 
Lord, I pray for all those who are still trees, that are still sucking out of the earth, trying to get that next drop of water, trying to get that, that next sustenance that they're hoping is going to get them by. Lord, help us to share the gospel of Jesus with them, your gospel that when you start cutting them down, instead of shaking their fist at you like I did, that they recognize, wait a minute, this is God reworking me into something else. He's drawing me into assembly. He's going to give me a good foundation. I don't need the world anymore. I just need the truth of Jesus Christ. I just need his foundation. That's enough. Lord, we got people going through that right now. They don't understand this remaking. May we be there to help them understand what this is. No, God's doing a good thing in you. Let him have his time. For anybody that says, well, I, I don't even know how to be saved. What do I do? Romans 10 verse 9 says that if you confess that Jesus is Lord, that means he is the boss. He now tells you what to do. You now obey him and do what he says. That if Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, if you believe this, then you will be saved. Pray with me. If you don't know if you're saved or not, pray with me. Father, forgive me. I completely blew it. I ruined it. Lord God, I didn't trust you. I did things the way I wanted to do it because I said it was my life, my way. Now I realize your way's better. My way was going to run me into ruin. Lord, I can't fix my life. It's too much of a mess. I'm tired of my life. I give it to you so you can give me a new one. I, I don't want my old life anymore. Take over. Thank you for the gift of eternal life, Lord. I thank you. I give it all to you. Thank you for dying on the cross to save me. You're my king. You are royalty. You're the truth. You're the way in. Thank you for buying me back at such a tremendous cost that I could never afford. You did what I would never be able to do, and that was give me eternal life. Thank you. I'm yours. Take over. In Jesus' name, amen. You are not worthless. You are priceless. Messiah Jesus died on the cross to redeem you. And that message took everything I had. <laughs>